Mr. Chairman, officers of NFL, fellow delegates, and friends. I believe that we are this mo at this very moment standing on the threshold of what could be the very, very darkest time for rural America and American agriculture that most of us have ever seen. I feel also that at this particular time that I might well be carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. I feel it is so very, very important that you understand what I'm going to tell you. That unless you do, I do not believe there's any hope for any of us. One of the greatest fears and the greatest problems that we've had in the past in solving or bringing about a solution for our problem has been complacency. We've had a feeling that whenever prices increased, reached a point that we considered satisfactory or near satisfactory. First of all, we made the mistake of believing they would have gone up of their own accord, and that too many of us do not realize that we were the very force that drove them up. But worst of all, that at about each time when we did succeed in making those gains, as a result of believing that the prices would have gone up anyway, we believed that they were here to stay and we forgot what we had organized for and failed to do, what we, you and I, as individual members needed to do to maintain those prices. Those of uh, you that are old enough to remember the coming of farm programs in the 30s. If you'll look back over the price record of the time, you cannot conclude anything else but that the prices on the commodities supported by these farm programs were the market price. Starting with the 30s through the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, I do not believe that most of us realize that they controlled our prices. And a few will say, yeah, but what about the 40s, the late 40s and the early 50s? We had pretty good prices then. It was still the support price in those farm programs. And as that formula in those programs was eroded and finally almost disappeared, our prices went right down with it. No time during that period of time till recent years have we been any substantial amount above that support price in any commodity. And I believe that unless the NFO is able to put the prices up that need to be put up and hold those that perhaps we consider as adequate, that we are sliding right back to that same level. I'd like to point out to you that those support prices that I'm talking about are in reality lower than they were 10 years ago when our costs were roughly one third of what they are today. And there's not a one among us that doesn't believe that we had a real problem at that time. I would like to ask you for just one moment to consider where you're going to be when corn goes back to a dollar, when wheat slides back to the lowest amount the law will allow. And that was our price for years. And then I think you have to come to a realization there isn't much there for any of us. I told you we had gains that were brought about, about by this organization. And I say 
without any fear of contradiction by anybody that is informed that not one single one of those prices in the major commodities for the last several years, not even the lousy prices, could have been as good as they were if it had not been for this organization, the participation of its members, and the foresight of its leadership. I am not trying to tell you in any way that there were not other things that helped us raise those prices, but I do maintain that none of these things by themselves that are credited with having raised those prices would have done it on their own without the collective bargaining program scrambling the markets and that set pattern that the production had been moving in, bringing back competition into the market and making the buyers bid against themselves or each other. In fact, many of the items that are credited for having raised our prices in years gone by actually had the very opposite effect, drove our prices down. But when we accept what is being said, by those who maintain that the nation must have cheap food at the price of the farmers, when we accept that without thinking it through, it's not too difficult to accept a very falsehood as an absolute fact. Let's go over some of the things that we made, the gains we made. We fought hard for quite a few years in organizing to bring those hog prices down or up from that terrible price of 12 and $14 where they were for years and years. And yet those prices did not go up until the NFO succeeded in blocking enough production after the holding action of 1968 to drive those prices to put competition back in. And within three weeks to four weeks after that program had been put in an operation and had very, very good support from our membership as a whole, we had those prices beyond the target prices of 2275 that we had set at that time. In fact, we hit 28. But when 28 came around, we hit the old bugaboo. We were being told, and too many of us accepted, that the price would have gone up anyway. And time after time, over the years when I was still vice president of the organization, I heard the statement nationwide. The NFO's got a couple of pretty sharp cookies at the head of it. They always start an action when the price is going to go up anyway. Think that one over for a minute. And then consider that if those cookies were that sharp, they would have not have had to take the butt chewing over the period of years. They could have made a fortune every day by bucking the market and wouldn't even have to see a farm or a farmer. Those prices went up because of the NFO programs. But after we had the $28, we became complacent. And instead of using the bargaining tool that we had, we used it as a piddling post to see whether we could get a quarter more somewhere else. The membership was informed that the participation was dropping, that unless we did bring the production together in volume and increase it constantly, we could expect to see those prices go down. But the answer was the same all over the country. $28 hogs, who needs collective bargaining? And so our words fell on deaf ears. And by and by, in rather rapid rate, 
The supply was again redivided among the packers out there in the country, and they took us right back to that 14 bucks. And then the cry went out every time you were in the country, what's NFO going to do about these lousy hog prices? Yeah. After the horse was gone, we were again ready to lock the barn. But it served its purpose. They were ready to block again. And we went into a program that was called Operation Hog Lift, putting together blocks of 50,000, taking them clear out of the area where they normally went, once more scrambling the regular route of supply. And in very short order, had the prices up once more, way beyond from even where we had dropped them or let them drop. And we succeeded in getting the floor price contracts. No problem, once we had the price way above them. And it was those floor price contracts that enabled us to hold the price and efforts that were later made, supposedly by the consuming public, the chain stores, and others. But while that was happening, we had the opportunity to write three-year contracts. And I think if we'd have pushed, could have written five-year contracts. Contracts based on the cost of production but those willing to accept those contracts always also wanted a ceiling. And roughly that ceiling would have been about $10 above that floor. We went to the country to get the production committed on a three or five year basis. And our members turned it down because they had heard of hogs going into the $50 and at the time, it would have been a $48 ceiling. Greed, extreme greed, and failure to see what we had accomplished made us turn it down. Let me put it bluntly. As members, you and I, we blew it. How would you like today to be under a, a contract for three or five years that guaranteed you cost of production plus a reasonable profit? The very goal that we set when we started to organize. But we weren't ready to listen. And we were greedy. We saw the same thing happen in other commodities. And I think that perhaps the biggest success that we ever had, and the fastest, was in the feeder cattle movement. When that program was put into effect with cattle at $26, it worked exactly as we were told it was going to work. And the production kept coming in and the volume kept growing. But as it went up fast, again, that attitude, the price would have gone up anyway. And now greed started coming in. I don't know how it was promoted or how it got there. But on account of the fast movement, it was real easy to convince the membership that there was no end to how high it was going to go. We hit $70 a hundred for cattle. Had the opportunity to contract one year ahead at that price. I think many of you have heard of one feeder meeting where there was a dollar bill pasted on the ceiling and the people trying to put the block of cattle together and under contract were told to look at that dollar bill there on the ceiling. A dollar a pound, that's the price. 
And when you can get us that, you come back. Again, they believed the prices were here to stay, that natural conditions had raised them, and the blocking of feeder cattle came to an end. We blew it. We dug our own grave because we weren't ready to listen. We blew it in other instances, too. We had it. We didn't hold it because we did not do what each of us needed to do to make the very goals of NFO or to get them in a solid grasp within American agriculture. Let me point out to you how it fast it can go. And on this I'm saying specifically for the grain producers, grain of all varieties. Over the country, virtually every meeting that I attend, I hear producers say, we're not worried about this year's crop. What are we going to do about the next one that comes along? I'd like to point out to you that a year and three months ago, the cattlemen and the livestock producers in general, together with the dairymen of this nation, were receiving the highest price in all history. And yet three months later, the cattle feeders of this nation were taking the biggest beating in their lifetime. They were not only losing that year's work, that year's grain, that year's effort, a good many of them lost everything that they had accumulated in 15 years, and some of them in a lifetime. They believed that those high cattle prices were here to stay and would continue to go right on up the easy way without any effort on their part. We have not recovered from it yet. And we talk about losses going back over the years and in the 30s. It wasn't possible before these last drops that came about, it was an utter impossibility to lose as much on one animal if we had sold them for a cent a pound than our producers lost in the last year. A very, very worrisome complacency. If you think that those green prices are here to stay for any length at all, you had better think again. The Secretary of Agriculture had as a goal for production this year 6 billion point four, 6.4 .4 billion bushel of grain, feed grain, I'm talking corn, other grains added the biggest crop of all time, fence to fence, pouring on all the fertilizer possible. And there was not one of us, I don't believe, that didn't believe if that were accomplished that we would take the beating of a lifetime on that production. We didn't get that crop and we feel that we're in a tight supply. Yet I'd like to point out to you that the feed grain situation in a very short time, the ratio, the balance between supply and consumption is going to be exactly the same as it would have been if Senior Butts had gotten his 6.4 billion bushel. Consider for a moment 
that we have 28% less cattle on feed than we did a year ago. Consider that we have 10% less hogs, and I believe that figure is too low. I think the cut is much greater than that. Broiler production down 8%. The breaks on the exports at about 70% of what it was last year. It figures out to me that unless there is a severe change that comes about, that I think can come about only in the increase in price of livestock and dairy products, that by April 1st, Mr. Butts will have his six point four billion bushel crop. He'll have it by reversing the consumption. How do you think that you are going to rise from that? We're at the point right now where the, the balance is about the equivalent of six billion bushel of corn. And I think it would already have happened, the collapse would be here, had it not been for the fear of so many people about nine months ago that the big crop was coming and the prices would disappear. And I think it's those contracts and the delivery on those contracts that have held it. But with the problems that we've had in our organization, Resulting, in my opinion, basically from the former president's enemy list, where you personally probably heard in the Senate hearings where his advisors, with his agreement, were talking about destroying the nonprofit organizations that were not cooperative or supporting the administration. I would have been ashamed of our organization if we had been supporting that administration. But <laughs> but nevertheless, we had to take the blunt of what they were carrying on. And I believe that the IRS investigation that we had to endure and the SEC movement was a direct result of that and some bribery that took place in the milk field. They accomplished or nearly accomplished what they were after to destroy the NFO programs. While they did not succeed, they really slowed them down. And if you will recall that just about two weeks ago, the grain prices were dropping the limit every day. And if you will recall that when the president, uh, present administration announced they were stopping certain export sales even though the threat was not carried out to the fullest extent, or maybe I'm calling it wrong when I call it a threat, even if it wasn't carried out, soybeans, for example, dropped 80 cents in one day on the cash market. And the futures had to come along the legal limit down for a number of days till they caught up with it again. Those contracts and that cooperation and participation is going to have to be restored and it is going to have to be restored fast unless we expect to take the beating of our life. But there are other things that are overshadowing our welfare in the economy. The economy as such, in my opinion, is sliding and sliding very, very fast. 
the industrial areas are already collapsing. Unemployment rising at a rate that we could not even comprehend at an earlier date. And the very method that was recommended as stopping the inflationary trend did the exact opposite that it was supposed to do. This was pointed out to you at many times. Is when we were being told as citizens that the way to drop the inflation is to take off money off of the economy so that there would be less to buy, less buyers or less production bought and prices would come down. The old law of supply and demand gimmick that hasn't worked for years anywhere except in agriculture to push prices down. The people did quit buying automobiles, didn't they? About 40% less than what they were buying. And if the old law of supply and demand, or perhaps better referred to as LSD, that sent us on a dreamer's trip, if it had been working or was working, then we should be buying automobiles today for 50% half of what we were, or at least 40% less, shouldn't we? What, <laughs> what did the automobile companies do when the sales dropped? They raised the prices to make up the difference in the overhead that the lesser unions uh, units were producing. And that's what they have to do, any sound business, if it's going to survive. But I'm wondering how many of those automobile sales or fa uh, uh, so automobiles that were not sold were a direct result of what happened in rural America. Can you imagine the cattle buyers? I mean, no, I mean the cattle buyers, I mean the cattlemen that lost their life savings in cattle in one year. Can you imagine them rushing to the automobile dealers to buy the new model of Buick? or maybe even the Cadillac that they may have dreamed of a year and three months ago. 20% of all automobile production goes directly to farms. And the entire mid-America, together with the Southwest and the Northeast, is totally and completely dependent on agriculture. Any rural town even some very big ones get every single penny they get from agriculture. And when those farmers don't have it, business goes down, profits and earnings within those towns go down, and there is no unemployment compensation to take up the slack. So if we were to put all of that together, with the automobiles that livestock producers and dairymen did not buy, I'm wondering what percentage of those people might still be working today had that condition not come about. But automobiles are only leading the pace. It is getting into other fields, television, radio, my hometown, a television company laying off 25% of its labor force. Those people aren't going to be buying very much, very long. And so it'll have a chain reaction that those people who produced, would have produced for those that were unemployed and for the farmers that might have gotten a fair price, those people then in turn will also not be working. Now I give you this build up 
to get across another important point, and that is the livestock producers and the dairymen's perhaps hope that grain prices come down and that he'll be back in the profit margin. Not so. Because then you have collapsed all of the farm economy. You will have collapsed the entire rural America, which has to collapse the rest of the metropolitan areas. So your consumption rate on your meat, on your dairy products, will also be dropping. They'll have to resort to a cheaper diet. Now each time that a consumer buys one pound of meat, milk, butter, or eggs, he is re in reality buying anywhere from five to eight pounds of my total production. But if I permit him to be forced onto a cheaper diet, it'll have to be a diet of cereals. Then each time that he eats a pound, I will have lost five to eight pounds, or maybe I should pour, say four to seven pounds of my total production. How, with that consumption, do you believe, even if all other things were equal, that you would receive the same prices today for livestock without some way to see to it that you got them? But that's not all. Whether you know it or not, your livestock prices are, at, to a great extent, determined by the price of grain. And the computer buyers of this nation in livestock feed the price of grain right on in to the computer with the rest of the figures when they determine what they're going to pay for hogs or cattle today or tomorrow. And so as those livestock or those grain prices come down, if they do, you better believe that your livestock prices will sink proportionately unless that you are able to stop it. That's pretty much the picture. And I hope that you do a little bit of thinking on it for yourself. It's too easy to be confused what you're hearing. I did not see it myself, and for that reason may not be reporting it correctly. This is the reason that I am saying it. But I was informed that the President of the United States in his press conference on Monday told the people to forget their worry about a depression, not to think about it. Wasn't that bad? And they'll take care of it. I am old enough, and many of you are here today, to remember that on a Friday in October in 1929, the President of the United States took to the air on radio to inform the American public, and these are his exact words, the economy of the United States has never ever been in better condition. The following Tuesday, four days later, it crashed. Went to hell in a hurry, didn't it? They wouldn't be telling you it was all right if it was. Think it over. You ever hear anybody tell you the economy was in good condition in 47, 48, 49, and 50? Not a word mentioned about it. Didn't have to. You knew it was. And now they hope you don't find out it's on the skids. Because you might do something about it if you did. We have no room 
no time to be complacent. You've built an organization. You've built a terrific organization. And a good many of you have an awful, awful lot in it, in effort, in time, in money. And you did it because you needed it and because you believed in it. But unfortunately, the time of organizing was so long that some of us lost sight of what we had actually organized for. We knew, we recognized that we had to be national, that we had to cover all productive areas. And we lost interest and perhaps lost our enthusiasm. But the efforts that you made are going to be the salvation of the economic community of rural America and of this nation if you use it the way you intend it to when you start building it. Every productive area in the United States is organized today. Every marketing area is set up. It is staffed. The programs have been established. They have been tried and found effective. Once they had that one ingredient that it needs in sufficient quantity, production. That's the power. That is the only power there is in this battle. Once you and I, as members, decide that we're going to use it to the fullest extent. I don't believe that there is one single one of you, or for that matter, one single member out there, or non-member, that won't agree that once enough production is put together that the nation has to have any single part of that block that then you're in position to set the price. Better than that. <laughs> Better than that. You'll be in an advantageous position in a number of other ways. Once they have to have a part of that block, then you're in a position to say you're going to take it all or you don't get any of it. Once you're in that position that you have brought enough production together in that block that they have to have, you're in a position to stop the imports if you want to do it. To use an example, in meat, once you have enough production together that they have to have part of that block, you're in a position to tell them, take your choice. You'll either take ours or take the old cow meat that you get and then see how you get along. You're in a position to say it, it's ours or nothing. There is almost nothing that we can't do to guide our economic destiny if we will do what we need to do, what we can do, and what we must do. I think we'll do it because we have to. And that's just about as good a reason to fight as any you can come up with. At the time, the SEC made its movement against us, and it looked like a very hopeless situation. 
and final analysis, there was nothing to do but fight. The remark was made that there'd be no Texas today if there had been a back door on the Alamo. There is none, if you've ever seen it. There was no way out of the back. It was fight, or else there was no choice. I believe that we're in that position. If we will but recognize it, we have no choice. I can see nothing but complete economic destruction ahead unless we stop it. I am not talking about yours and my economic welfare or way of making a living. I'm talking about our existence. Our survival is at stake right here. <laughs> this can't even be compared, what I'm talking about, to the Depression of the 30s. It is so much more severe that in my opinion, and as I've heard it said by others, the depression of the 30s will look like a Sunday scale, Sunday picnic. And let's look at it for just a moment, what some of the big differences are today and why it will be so very much worse. By and large, in the late 20s, early 30s, we were still operating with horses. In reality, we didn't need any money at all to operate for anything else but personal taxes, real estate taxes. And they were negligible at that time. But people concerned themselves about it. And perhaps in a way had the same attitude that we have today. Only it was new to them. I still recall when the income tax came in which was one half of one percent on everything above ten thousand bucks, ten thousand dollar exemption. I can see him still see my dad standing there hollering, it's unconstitutional, they can't do that to us. What portion does that take on today as compared to that time? But we were operating with horses. We had our own fuel in the form of hay, oats, and pasture. We could operate without cash outlay. We grew our own seed, too. And even if we bought our seed corn, selected in the field by hand and then graded a dollar a bushel, and we stretched it over 10 acres, our cost was 10 cents a bushel, or 10 cents an acre. This last year, roughly, our price was around $30 a bag. Oh, no, not a bushel. See, bushel weighs 56 pounds. And somebody found a way to make it real handy for us because you don't know how much many kernels are in a bushel. So as a convenience now, they sell us a bag of 80,000 seeds, see? But still got us believing it's a bushel. 44 pounds, about an average. One of those bags costing $30 this year covered three acres for me. I don't have my price for next year, as I think you don't either but I'm told that I can expect about 48 bucks a bushel. That cost is 500 times as high today as it was just comparing it to the quantity. But when you break it down to the acres, almost a thousand times as high. We had our own seed. We were pretty well fixed in our home, too. 
our wives or our mothers canned enough fruit, vegetable, packed enough meat. We had our own butter, our own eggs. And so we had no real concern about the food. It was there. Our mothers or our wives had seen to it. We don't have that today. We didn't need any money for fuel either. We burned wood. We burned cobs. We had our own fuel in most cases right out there on the farm. Our light wasn't very expensive either. Ten cents for a gallon of gasoline, and or not gasoline, but kerosene, and sometimes as low as six cents a gallon would light our homes for 30 to 60 days. We didn't need any power to pump our water. We had the windmill and the watering of our livestock and the water we used was free. And many of us found ourselves without even one dime in our pocket in 1932. If I were to reach that position today or any time in the future, now that I have modernized, I wouldn't be able to eat no electricity to cook, any old wood stove or cob burners are gone. I couldn't heat my home because I wouldn't be able to buy gas, and if I had it, I couldn't do without electricity to force the heat through my home. Worse than that, I wouldn't even be able to get a drink of water on my own farm. I started farming in that period of time with $500. And that's not to be overlooked because at that time I thought that was about half of the money in the world. I'm not so sure but what it not, might not have been. But I started. That's all I had. $500 and a desire to go. I'm all set up today, but it's going to take about $370 to fill my planter in the morning to go to the field. Fuel, fertilizer, seed, insecticide and three hundred and seventy dollars will run me till ten o'clock. Once she collapses, how are you going to start it again? This then leads me to another field that I think we need to discuss. That's the hungry people of this world. And I don't believe there's anyone that wants to feed them any more than I do. But I do resent the deception and the hypocrisy that is going with it and flowing through our news today. We're led to believe that we have to produce real cheap so that the hungry people can eat. And it doesn't make any more sense than Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors selling cars cheap enough that they can buy an automobile. They'd like to ride, too. But how long would Chrysler... <laughs> how long would Chrysler, Ford, or General Motors last? And then there would be no automobiles for anybody. Not even those that think they're sitting pretty. 
The hungry people of this world never were, never have been, and never will be fed through normal marketing channels. They have to be fed as a result of compassion of other people and other nations seeing to it that they have the food that they have no way to buy. And I do not believe that it's the responsibility of the 3% of the people of this nation that are farmers to absorb that entire cost. I believe that it is the responsibility of those people who are making the noise and are condemning us and members of NFO for our hopes and our ambitions and the goals that we've set to meet those conditions that we can produce. I believe it is those people's responsibility to share that cost. I think the hypocrites had better be getting into the act, too. Those people who condemn our people for not wanting to continue to produce an animal that they know they're going to lose a hundred dollars a head on feeding. Those people who condemn the people that are trying to solve this problem when they're not, when our people refuse to be willing to work an entire year for nothing and then include savings from the past to do it. When those hypocrites get ready to give me a year's pay to produce those animals, I'll say they've got a right to talk. I think maybe an expression that Mr. Butts got in trouble with might play in here in another form. You know play the game, you know make it a rule. <laughs> but I'd like to point out to you if where and when I can get at those that either through hypocrisy or plain ignorance don't understand it, that unless that you and I succeed in keeping this agricultural plant economically sound so that we can produce, they're going to see those hungry people right here. You don't produce with propaganda. It takes money and a lot of it. And should this agricultural plant get into the condition that it was in the 30s, I described it to you, everything's going to come to a standstill. And it is on this basis that I say we're not fighting for our way of life. We're fighting for our very survival. And the battle begins. The battle begins and begins now. Now let me go back, repeat one statement I made, and then go from there, see where we go. That statement was that there is not one member in this room, or in my opinion, one farmer out there in the country that doesn't believe that once we get enough production together that the nation has to have any part of that block that at that time will be able and ready to set our price. I think we agree on that. 
I think you accept the general principle. But there is one thing that you have not accepted. Not as a whole, a few, but in my opinion, a very few. The responsibility of getting that done. I think there's still too many of us that think that if we go to a meeting or a convention, wear a button, an NFO button, and applaud every time somebody says NFO or collective bargaining, that we're good members. Oh, no, we're not. We, too, become hypocrites if we do not do what it means, what has to be done to solve the problem. That is get the production together. So we've got one important thing to do. And first of all, each of us on ourselves is to discipline ourselves, face squarely what needs to be done, then do it and see to it that your neighbor also does. So step by step, what is it? How must we discipline ourselves or discipline ourselves to do what? First of all, each of us, you and I, going to have to discipline ourselves enough that we will see to it that every single pound of our production goes into that program. and get ourselves off of this foolish idea that if we contribute a few crumbs, that we have cooperated. And I'm going to use an example to show you what I mean. I'm going to talk about a marketing area. And I'm going to change the number of counties just a little so that nobody can track which one I'm talking about. Maybe when I get done, I'll tell you which one it is. A marketing area, 18 counties, in the heart of the Corn Belt, heaviest grain producing area in the world, will average better than 10 million bushel a county. Pretty good spot to be in, isn't it? If you're going to get production together. Well, they had a grain meeting in it. We're going to block grain, boy. We're going to show Cargill. Continental can't push us around. So we have an area grain meeting. And the 18 counties signed up, believe it or not, 26,000 bushel of corn. Half of it from one county. So the other 17 counties put together 13,000. Brother, that's getting the job done, ain't it? And actually went home believing, boy, they'd made collective bargaining work. There is not a one of those 18 counties that didn't have at least one NFO member in every, not one, in, there's not a one of the counties that didn't have at least one NFO member in them that could by himself have signed up 52,000, twice as much. And they think they're bargaining. And have a smug attitude. Well, I signed up some grain. Now, when the, uh, they call them, I was going to say boneheads, the hardheads, I guess, and the hardheads wake up, we got it done. So the man with 52,000 bushels signed up 1,000, 
and then sent 51,000 bushel against it to neutralize it. Let's wake up. Are we blocking grain to deceive our fellow members or our neighbors? Or to act as martyrs? Or are we ready to buckle down and do what needs be done? I told you I'm going to tell you who's car, who's what area that was. I'll do it right now. It was yours. <laughs> and that was the best one. I haven't told you about the bad ones. Think of it, ladies and gentlemen. That's tomfoolery. You think you're going to kid the buyers into buy and paying a price? As one power, one only, the production. So first of all, we must discipline ourselves to do what each and every one of us knows has to be done, and not just put in enough that we can fool the others and put more on the opposite side to make sure it doesn't raise the price. But then we need to go one step further. Then you and I, individually, must assume the responsibility of seeing to it that our fellow farmer, first of all, our, fe fe our fellow member, puts his production in to the fullest extent. He'll do it if he knows what it's all about. I run into a member on my way to a meeting while I was eating supper, recognized me, came over to me and visited, asked me where I was going. I told him I was going to a meeting in his area, his county. We were going to try to block grain. We had previously, this is some time ago, we had previously put together enough for a barge load in this community. And he didn't know anything about the meeting, so he said, probably not. Nor did he know that we were moving grain in his county. I visited with him, just barely, very lightly. Finally asked him, would he go to the meeting with me? Because he had told me he had 35,000 bushel of corn and that, yeah. He'd be glad to do that. He went to the county meeting with me. I went to the county grain committee and told him this guy liked to sign up 35,000 bushel. And the committee got mad at him. We needed that last week. Why didn't a bastard come and tell us then? That's not much encouragement, is it? And we don't get it done by fighting them, but we get it done by explaining it to them. Regardless of what he has done since, he still joined the NFO because he wanted a price and wanted to help get it. And no one has ever told anyone that anyone else was going to do it for him. We've always told you it's a do-it-yourself kit. It won't do us a bit of good if we don't use it. So we must discipline ourselves. First, see to it that we are doing what is right. Get that production together. It's the only answer there is. It's either that or doomsday. And I think that's reason enough to do it. Then get our fellow members to put his production together. But we've got still one more step to take. 
we've got to get other farmers to add to that block by joining the NFO. There isn't a farmer out there today that doesn't want a price and in my opinion is willing to make an effort to get it if he knows what to do and understands it. And this is our responsibility to see to it that he does understand it. If those non-members were to tell you what they've actually been led to believe that the NFO is, it would horrify you. They just simply do not know. And it's up to you and me to see to it that they do. They want to help if they know what to do and understand why they're doing it. I hear members say all over the nation, no use me going out and seeing any I saw them bastards a hundred times. There's a lie to start with. Would any man let you see them a hundred times? And I'll lay odds that for the last three years, at the very most of you haven't even asked anybody. But you're kidding yourself. And hope the other guy believes it so that you don't have to do what needs to be done. We're going to do it. And our failure to do it will take us nowhere but to destruction, pure and simple. Now, you may be able to fool the other guy with alibis, but there's one more person that you'd better start thinking about. Can you deceive yourself? What would it be like to feel that you had the opportunity, that you were urged time after time to do what you yourself knew must be done and then didn't do it and saw your own family in a problem. Could you live with it? I don't think I could. And I'm not going to have to. I'll ride you guys till who laid the chunk if I'm given the opportunity. I think that pretty well sums it up. We have to have 30% as our estimate to go all the way. And it'll come easy as the block starts building. Action is contagious. And if you yourself will just do that first step of seeing to it that your production is moving, that next guy will get a little bit curious and he'll start moving. And when you get, up, when you get all NFO members to moving, that non-member get to feeling a little bit guilty too maybe think he's missing something. Has that effect? Like during World War II when so many things were rationed or when there were short supplies of everything, it was not unusual to see a line of people in front of a place of business. One day I went up to guys in that line and said, what are you doing in that line? What they sell? I don't know, but everybody else wants some, so I don't see why I don't get it. And that's about the way your line will build out there in the country. Little actions that we've had, specifically the little porker operation. The first one of those held just east of the home office. There were a lot of new non-members there and joined. And these is what I'd term Yoo-Hoo members. Yoo-Hoo, sign me up. That's getting them pretty easy. But how many do you think we would have gotten if each and every one of us had been out and canvassing the neighborhood? We are writing new members, and we are writing a lot of them. 
where the farmers are being asked. But if you don't ask them, how can they join? And even if they tell you no the first time, what chance has he got saying yes the second time if you quit asking the first time? We can do it. We have to do it. And in my opinion, we will do it. So let's follow those steps. Let's get control of ourselves. You're not destroying anybody but yourself. And if the other guy doesn't do it, he's destroying you. Are you going to stand still for that? You had a beautiful field of grain, and your neighbor's cattle got into it. Would you go over and see him about that? Or would you just kind of hope they go away? And say, well, there's that hard head's cattle again. Just cuss him and let it go. He is destroying your production. I don't care how much you raise. If you don't get a price, you would be better off if you had never raised it. At least you wouldn't have a loss. And he's destroying your production if he's hindering your price, the same as if his cattle were destroying your crop. When are you going to wake up and keep him from doing it? He don't want his cattle in your bank account to destroy it, but he's going to have to know that that's what he's doing. He wants a price, but he's going to have to know how he's going to get it. And they will come. Just one example. Bill Selhorst held a meeting in my backyard at Sioux City. I got big backyard. Anyway, he held a meeting at Sioux City. Advertised as an NFO cattle meeting. And over 600 cattlemen attended. And the people there represented 2% of all the fat cattle in the United States. 14 more like it would be 30%. It can be done. They're interested. That was the big letters over the top. NFO cattle meeting. They want a price. That's what they came for. So do one other thing. Anybody that you talk to about NFO, collective bargaining, or the situation in general, talk to him as though he did not know one single thing about it. Because if you assume that he knows things that he does not know, you have not gotten the message across, and you will not have eliminated the foolish ideas he has. There's one other thing that we must do in putting this production together as we go around meetings, and that's for God's sake, stop bitching. I don't care how many members, non-members, you bring into that meeting and have some guy bitching all night long about the program, the committee, the county chairman, or something that he don't think is the way it ought to be. How can that man join? That man's made it impossible. And this sort of thing brings about an erosion of cooperation. It takes away from those who want to cooperate the spirit and even the hope of accomplishing something. You've never gained anybody as a member by telling them that the officers were bastards or the program didn't work or that you got rooked on everything you did. 
you better take inventory of those people. We've got to get 30% together. We can do it if each of us does what we need to do. And that sounds like a lot, but it's only, even if we didn't count our own members, be three out of every ten farmers. And even if that sounds a lot to me, maybe this to you, maybe this is more encouraging. There's seven of those hard heads out of every ten you don't need. Think that one over. And I think the other three would have at least some soft spot in that hard head if they're properly approached. We can do it, we must do it, and we have to do it now. Not next month, next year. My opinion, it's not done in the next six months. It's all over. So in closing, I'd like for each of you to think over a prayer that I'm going to give you. And I'm doing this specifically because each of us, for every meeting that we have, we open it with prayer. And I think that's the way it should be. And if you could see what has transpired and the odds that we have bucked and situations have arisen that seemed impossible and looked like a real blow that actually in the final analysis turned out to be a big boon to us, then nobody ever going to talk me out of this one thing that we've had, divine guidance. We've had it in no uncertain terms. But while we open those meetings with prayer and then let ourselves be guided by extreme greed, as in the instances I mentioned earlier, I would also expect the good Lord to set me back where I belonged. So I'd like to take off on a prayer that I heard many years ago I believe it is credited to the Quakers. The prayer was, Dear Lord, reform the people of the world, but start with me. I'd like to have you pray it with me and to yourselves in just a little different form. Lord, help me do or help the farmers do what they know has to be done, but start with me and make me do it. Now I know I told you a lot of things that you didn't want to hear. I thank you ever so much for having listened. I believe that maybe I feel a little better now than when I started. I thank you from the bottom of my heart that over the period of years you have accepted what I've said, and I think it has made me enjoy doing what I did. But now I'm asking for one more thing. I'm not running for any office. I don't need any votes. But I'm going to ask you for more than I have ever asked you for before. Help me survive. I can't do it without you. And you can't help me without helping yourself. You have accepted in the past what I've said. 
Now I ask you, do what I ask. I thank you. Let's put that much into blocking production. Then we got...